And another thing that is to be seen <coughs> is that for yoga to become beneficial in life, you need to prepare the ground of your personality. It is not good enough going to a yoga class, practicing some asana, pranayam, relaxation, and then come out saying, I have done my yoga for the day. No. Ah, there are people who do it, and they should do it, very good. But that is not the aim or the end of the yogic process. For yoga to become effective in life, you have to prepare the ground of your mind and nature. Just as before you farm, you have to prepare the earth. You have to loosen the earth. You have to mix the earth. You have to remove the weeds from the earth. You have to remove the rocks and stones from the earth. You have to prepare the soil. And only when the earth is ready, when the hardness has gone, when soil has become loose, do you plant the seeds. If you throw seeds on a hard ground, what will happen? You know, once upon a time, one priest went to a desert, desolate area and acquired a piece of land. And that land was very rocky, barren without anything. It only had shrubs of nettle and thorns. And this priest put in a lot of effort in cleaning the area, in preparing the ground, and converting that barren land into a beautiful, extraordinary garden. And he was so proud of this garden that he used to call all his neighbors to come and see it, to admire it. And whenever neighbors would come to look at it, you know, he used to be very happy that this garden is a shining example of one's Purushartha, which can convert a barren piece of land into a beautiful created creation. One day another person comes and who goes around the garden and says, this is beautiful. Look at this lovely creation of God. The priest became very angry. He said, what lovely creation of God? This is my hard work. You should have seen this piece of land when God was the owner of it. <laughs> it is through my hard work that I have converted this barren piece of land into a beautiful garden. Now, this is only a joke which I am telling to wake you up a little bit. <laughs> but the message is contained in it. That it is your effort, your purushartha, your prayatna, your sadhana, which will lead you towards perfection. And just as you have to prepare the ground to farm, you have to prepare the ground of your nature and personality for yoga to become effective. And there is a lot of hardness in our mind, in our heart. Swami Shivananda, 
our Param Guruji used to tell us that human being expresses three qualities in life. The quality of head, the quality of heart, and the quality of hands. Head representing the intellect, heart representing the feelings, sentiments, emotions, and hands representing performance, action, involvement, participation. So intelligence, sentiments, and action. These are the three expressions of every human being. And an integrated development of human personality means an integrated approach to these three areas of our expression. To bring in creativity in that dimension. And it is the integration of the faculties of head, heart and hands that becomes the purpose of yoga. And our head and our heart, our intellect and our emotions. They have become so centered, self-centered, that there is no scope for their expansion and growth and development. At different times in our life, we imbibe different kind of learning. The learning which builds up our character, our personality, our nature, our samskaras, happens before the age of eight. When we do not expose ourselves to the formal academic intellectual education. And the day the formal academic intellectual education begins, learning A, B, C, D, learning to recognize the letter, to write the letter, the faculties of intellect are stimulated and the other faculties which are the unconscious receptors in the formation of our personality, they shut down. And intellect becomes dominant in our life. And it remains predominant, it remains dominant till the end of our days. And when intellect becomes dominant factor, dominant power in our life, then it is the application of this intellect which can lead you astray or lead you in the right path. It can assist you and it can become a barrier also. If you remember the statement of Maharishi Aurobindo, He used to say that in the beginning, intellect was my friend. It helped me. And later on, it became a barrier. Therefore, transcend intellect. This is a statement by him. Is it only a statement or is it a reality, a fact of life? Yes, it is a fact of life. Because our intelligence, our intellect is shaped by the indriyas and the vishyas that are surrounding us all the time. Our intellect is shaped by the influences of the family, the society and the culture in which we are living all the time. And with the development of human intellect, the spiritual growth becomes stunted. And as long as you use or apply your intellect to understand the spiritual nature that is within you, you will never be able to make any progress.
because spiritual nature is an experience not of intelligence but of inner awareness and intuition and not the linear and the logical process that intellect follows. And when the intellect follows a linear and logical process and conditions itself to see and perceive the world in a specific way that it deems fit, then it restricts your ability to become aware of other methods, other ways, other manners. And therefore, yoga has given a very simple sutra that modify this mental behavior with the attempt to inculcate softer qualities in life, improved qualities in life, better qualities in life by adopting the principles of ahimsa, satya, asteya, aparigraha, brahmacharya, the five yamas, and the shots, santosh, tap, swadhyaya, and ishwar pranidhan, the five niyamas. The yamas and niyamas help prepare the ground of personality to attain the experience of yoga. Am I clear so far? And therefore, they are things that should not be ignored or even negated by yoga practitioners. And this is the first mistake that a yoga practitioner makes. They think yamas and yamas to be the moral code of conduct and the yoga ethics, which are outdated. And you have become modern, so you believe that they should not be practiced and straight away jump into the third level, asan, and that becomes your final destination. And it is for this reason I have come to believe that despite a growing interest in yoga, people are not able to understand what yoga has to offer. And they are confining the practices of yoga to the body only, the feel-fit factor. And this feel-fit factor is only confined to the body experience. Oh, today I'm feeling light. I had backache, but I did some yoga and, yeah, it has gone 90%. Or when I woke up in the morning, I had heavy head. I did some yoga and it feels light. Yeah, it works. I mean, what kind of application is this? You are using a cannonball to kill a mosquito. <laughs> you are using a cannonball to kill a mosquito. If this is the application of yoga in your life, And after the perfection of yamas and niyamas, when the mind, the ground of the mind has been prepared to sow the new samskaras, then you begin with the practice of asanas. Now, coming back to this samskara point, for a little while before I continue with the asana and the other practices of yoga. Why do we need to practice yama and niyama? To change the tamasic expression of our personality. There is aggression there is anxiety, there is violence, there is distraction, anticipation. When mind runs after the pleasures, craves for them,
strives for them, works for them. And at that time, the positive forces of personality remain dormant. And these aggressive forces become active. And when the aggressive forces become active, then the positive confidence, clarity, does not come. So when you pick an idea of ahimsa or satya or asteya or aparigraha, or Brahmacharya, and you try to incorporate that idea in your life as much as possible, and you maintain that idea in front of your awareness as much as possible during the day, and you try to merge yourself and develop that particular idea in your life behavior, then that process is like fine-tuning the radio. When you fine-tune the radio, when you want to listen to one channel, one station, you have to move the dial. And as the dial comes close to a station, you hear the garbled sound. And as you fine-tune the channel, the garbled sound becomes clear and clear and clearer until it becomes clear without any distortion, clear without any break. So the fine-tuning of the mental forces, the mental energies happen when you try to cultivate the opposite of what you are experiencing in your life. If there is aggression in your nature, in your character, in your personality, then you cultivate the non-aggressive behavior, ahimsa. If there is falsity, hypocrisy in your life, arrogance in your life, then you cultivate the component of satya. Mm -hmm.